Section 12.4 is on the normal distribution, and section 12.5 is problem solving with the normal distribution. Whenever you are studying something in everyday life, and you graph your data points, and your data points make this curve shape, this bell jar shape, where the largest mound is in the dead center, that's what we call the normal graph or the normal curve. And it's really important because a lot of things in everyday life do have this normal curve shape if we were to plot that data. And whenever you have data that does make this normal curve shape, there are a lot of awesome properties about the normal distribution that allow us to further analyze our data. For starters, if you were to calculate the mean, median, and mode of your data that falls in a normal curve shape, it all will land in the dead center there. So the mean, median, and mode are all in the middle, always, of a normal curve. We'll talk about more of the properties later in this video as we go along with the examples. But just be aware that there are a lot of things in everyday life that, if you were to graph them, would make this normal distribution shape, this curve shape, where the largest mound is in the center. For example, if I were to study the heights of males living in the US, and I were to use computer software to graph them, yep, it would make this normal curve shape. Same with heights of women in the US. I could study weights of men, compare weights of women. I could study measurements of fruit, vegetables, plants, uh, the length of a boa constrictor, different animals, IQ scores. You get the idea, just the possibilities are endless. Uh, cars, if I'm building a car, certain parts, their measurements uh, fall into this shape. So let's look at example one. Example one says the scores on a test are normally distributed. So whenever it says that in your word problem, that means you can use those special properties of the normal curve with the mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. Find the score that is A, two standard deviations above the mean, and B, three standard deviations below the mean. Two different ways you could get the correct answer for this type of question. You could use a formula or you could visualize it and use a graph. So if I look at the graph for starters, and let's start say that I'll start with part A, two standard deviations above the mean. The mean is always located in the dead center of your curve, your normal curve. The standard deviation is the spread how far from the mean in the middle does your data lie? And if it's above, that means you're going to move to the right of the mean in the graph. Whereas if it says the word below the mean, it means you're going to hop to the left of the mean, to the left of center. So going back to A, if I'm, if I'm going to move above, two standard deviations above the mean means I'm going to hop two hops to the right. So let's say about here is one hop. And here's two hops. The mean they tell you that's in the middle is 100. If I go to the right, I'm going to add the standard deviation over and over again. However, if I hop to the left, I'm going to subtract the standard deviation repeatedly with each hop. Circle my plus symbol, circle my minus symbol here. So since part A says above, meaning I'm moving to the right, I'm going to be adding repeatedly. So if I hop once to the right from the middle, 100 plus the standard deviation is 20. So 100 plus 20 means I now land at 120. However, I want to make two hops above the mean, two hops to the right, so I need to hop again. So now take 120 add another 20. So you're always adding or subtracting the standard deviation. I'm adding since I'm moving to the right. So 120 plus 20 again is 140. So visually, what is 
two hops to the right above the mean, 140 for this question. So 140 is the final answer. If you're not big into graphing, if you'd rather just use a formula and crunch out that same answer, you can do so. What you would do is you would always start with the mean. And then because it says the word above, you are going to add. And you're going to take the number of hops you're supposed to move with the, that's the standard deviation. And you're going to times it by what the standard deviation actually is. So I'll put S period D period to abbreviate standard deviation. So mean plus number of hops, I abbreviated number of the hashtag times, I used parentheses for times, SD for standard deviation. So showing you what I mean by that, our mean was 100 plus number of hops, they tell you to make two hops, times the standard deviation, they said was 20. So I'm going to do 100 plus 2 times 20. I'm going to multiply before I add, good old order of operations, 2 times the 20 for 40. So 100 plus 40, yep, I get the same exact answer doing it the formula way, which is 140. So 140, final answer to part A. Let me write it a little bit darker in black just so it's easier to read. Looking at B. B says now to find three standard deviations below the mean. Below means I'm going to move to the left. When I move to the left, I subtract instead of add. So if I go back to my picture, let's do this one in blue to color code it. One hop to the left, well 100 was the mean in the middle. Mean is always in the middle, remember, for the normal curve. I subtract the standard deviation, which was 20. 100 minus 20 gives me 80. That's just one hop to the left. Now let's do two hops to the left. Take that 80, subtract 20, the standard deviation again. I get 60. Let's do three hops to the left. 60 minus 20 gives me 40. So three hops below the mean, one, two, three, is gonna land you at 40. That's doing it the picture way. Now, let's do it the formula way. So the formula way, would be to take, you always start with the mean in the middle. Below means you're gonna subtract, as opposed to part A where we added since it was the word above. So below I'm gonna subtract. Same idea as part A, the number of hops that the question tells you to move times the standard deviation, which I'll abbreviate S period D period again. So the mean was 100 minus the number of hops this time was 3, times the standard deviation is still 20. So 100 minus 3 times 20 gives me 100 minus 3 times my 20 for 60. 100 minus the 60, there's that final answer of 40. So with these types of questions, it's up to you. You can use the formula way, which is what view and example is going to show you, or you can visualize it drawing the picture. But 40 is the final answer to part B. Another important property of the normal curve, as soon as you know you're dealing with the normal curve, the normal distribution, there is something called a 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And that rule, just like it sounds, means that 68% of your data will always lie one hop on either side of the middle. So in other words, there's your mean in the middle. And if I go one hop in both directions, one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right, and put it all together, that large mound is going to always be 68% of your data every single time. I'm shading it in red currently. If from the middle, because you start in the middle with these graphs, you count two hops in both directions, two standard deviations to the left and two standard deviations to the right, that is going to be 
5% of your data is gonna lie there. So I'll shade that. So here's two hops left, because hop one, hop two, hop one to the right, hop two to the right. So two hops total in both directions. Now you've upped it to 95% of your data with the normal curve will always lie two hops on either side. If you wanna take it a step further yet, and you wanna go three hops both sides of the middle, of the mean in the middle, that's gonna be 99.7% of your data will fall there. So here's one hop from the middle to the left, two hops, three hops, one hop to the right, two hops, three hops. So almost all of the graph, 99.7% of it, will be three hops in either direction. I'm shading it in black currently. Again, in that dead center of the normal curve is always the mean. So in this particular example, which is price of a model of a new car, I see 17,000. In the middle there is gonna be the mean average. Let's read our example, example two. Not everyone pays the same price for the same model of a car. The figure illustrates a normal distribution for the prices paid for a particular model of a new car. The mean is 17,000, well we already said that since it lands in the middle, and the standard deviation is 500. And you'll notice if you add the 500 as you go to the right, yep, 17,000 plus 500, 17,500 plus 500 again, there's the 18,000 and so on and so forth. When you move to the left on the normal curve, that's when you subtract the standard deviation as we saw on the last slide. So 17,000 minus 500, yep, that's how they got the 16,500. That's how they got the 16,000. So we can see visually where they got these numbers. Now let's look at the question it's asking. Just want to make sure we understood the graph first. It says use the 68, 95, 99.7 rule to find the percentage of buyers who paid A, between 16,500 and 17,500. Well, as long as you have a graph, then just shade the region the question's referring to and we'll use these percentages accordingly. So if I shade between 16,500 and 17,500, that's one hop to the left from the middle and one hop to the right from the middle combined. Well, that's always gonna be 68%. As long as we know that rule, that's a really easy question. So A, final answer, 68%. B. This is all part of the same question. I'm gonna change it to blue. Between 16,000 and 17,000. So that's two hops to the left of the middle only. Well, we can play with these percentages a little bit because another awesome quality about the normal curve is that it's symmetric. If I were to fold this curve on the middle, on the mean average there, it would overlap with itself. I don't know yet what I've shaded, but I do know that the percentage that's the closest to it is 95%, in the sense that 95% would be if I shaded two hops to the left and two hops to the right. However, I've only shaded half of the 95% because I've only shaded two hops to the left. I have not shaded two hops to the right. So what I can do is take the 95% that it relates to, and since I only shaded half of the 95% region, cut it 95% in half. So you could do 95 divided by two, or you could take 95 times one half. It means the same thing, honestly. So if I do 95 divided by two, half of the 95% region is 47.5. So the answer to part B, 
Now looking at C, I'll use black ink for this, more than 17,500. So here's 17,500, more than means to the right, whereas less than would mean shade to the left, of course. But more than, I just want that little tiny tail section to the right. Well, there are two different ways that I could get the right answer here. If I look at this graph, I notice that, I'm gonna play with the geometry a little bit here, I notice that I don't have any of the 68% highlighted. So that 68%, well half of the 68%, if I take 68 and divide by two, it gives me 34. So from here to here is 34%, and also from the middle to the right is always gonna be 34%. So I labeled the little slice that's 34% and the slice beside it that's also 34%. Well, half of the graph is always 50%. If I were gonna cut my graph right here where I'm doing this blue divider, from here to the end is 50%. Same thing with here, to that other end. From here to the right end is also. Oop. From here to the right end, there we go, is also 50%, the other half of the graph. So if I want this black region, I'm dealing with 50%, the upper half of the data here, but I don't want this little 34%, so I can take the 50% and subtract away the 34%, and that means that that little tail end is 16% after I subtract. So the final answer to part C is 16%. So that's one way you could get the correct answer, as long as you know that each of these little slices here is 34, 34, and this half is 50%, and this half is 50%. Let me show you the other way you could have gotten that same correct answer of 16%. I'm going to go ahead and still shade the part we want. We still want more than 17,500, this little tail end. So I say the whole entire graph put together is 100% always of anything. That's true in statistics and in probability. I don't want this entire 68% region. It's not highlighted at all. So if I don't want it, if I want to cut it away, that means I want to subtract it. So 100 minus the 68% leaves me with 34%. Excuse me, 32%. Leaves me with 32% rather. So from, I'll do this in red, here to here, plus from here to here, gives me a total of 32%, since I've cut away the middle chunk of the graph. Well, I don't want both the end pieces, I only want the end piece on the right. So if I only want half of the end pieces, I only want one end piece, I can now take 32 and divide by two. 32 divided by two is 16%. So 16% is each end piece, and we wanted one of the end pieces, so that's another way that you could see that that end piece is 16%. What's nice is we've already done the work for this, so whenever in the homework you have this little tail end filled in that you're looking for, you know from here on out it will always be 16%. A lot of times before we work with data points that are in the normal curve, we want to standardize them. And the way to do that is to convert those data points to something called a z-score. The formula to do that is pretty easy. It's shown here. You're going to take whatever the data value is, and you're going to subtract the mean average, which the question will give to you. And then you're going to take that difference, and you're going to divide it by the standard deviation, which the question will also provide for you. Every time, so you're going to subtract the mean and divide the standard deviation. Notice that if you do do this as one step in the calculator, 
you do need to type in parentheses around your numerator. Taking a look at example three, it says a set of data items is normally distributed. So that's your hint that you're allowed to use the z-score formula and any of the properties of the normal curve are up for grabs because the question literally tells you this is normally distributed with a mean of 60 and a standard deviation of eight. Convert each of the below data items to a z-score. We got 68, 60, and 48. And we do want the final answer as a decimal rather than a fraction for a change. Keeping that in mind, let's start with 68. So I wanna do the z-score, that's my z there, for 68. So the notation typically used is I have 68 as a subscript of z equals, time to use the formula, parentheses, my data item is 68, so take the number you're given, that's your data item, minus the mean, they tell you in the original question was 60, divided by the standard deviation, they tell you in the original question was eight. I'm gonna break it up into two steps. So I'm gonna do 68 minus the 60, the numerator first, which gives me eight, divided by the eight on the bottom, gives me a final answer of one. So the z-score for 68 with this particular example anyway, with this particular mean and standard deviation is one. Then I could from there use a table that will appear in the My Math Lab homework that will tell me what percent a z-score of one with a normal curve is associated with. Let's try another one, just converting the z-scores for now. I want to convert 60 and see what its z-score is. So convert it to its z-score. So plugging in the data item this time is 60 minus the mean happens to also be 60 divided by the standard deviation is eight. Sixty minus sixty on the top gives me zero, divided by bring over the eight. Zero is okay to have on the top of a fraction, I just can't have it on the bottom. Zero divided into eight equal parts gives me back zero. So whenever you're finding the z-score of a data point that is actually the mean, because 60 was the mean, the z-score for the mean will always end up being zero every time. And remember, visually, it's located in the dead center of that normal curve. Looking at C, oh, let's change it to blue. I want the z-score for 48. So I take 48 minus the mean is still 60 divided by eight is still the standard deviation. 48 minus 60 gives me negative 12 to divide by the eight. Yes, you can have negative z-scores. And when you do that in your head or type it in the calculator, you get negative 1.5. Resist the urge to convert it to a fraction because remember, we actually want it left as a decimal, these z-scores, every time. Example four says to use the z-scores and the corresponding percentiles shown. Test scores are normally distributed with a mean of 74 and a standard deviation of 10. What percentile of the scores are, and then there's a chart, A below 88, B above 88, C between 85 and 88. So here's a real life example of how we could figure out, as long as we know that it's normally distributed, and we are told that right here in the original question, we can figure out percents of where our data is going to fall. So first step is still going to be to convert our data item to a z-score using the formula from the last slide. After we do that, we're going to be on the lookout for the words below, above, or between, and that's going to tell us how to get the final answer. Remember, the formula for a z-score was you took your data item, you minus from it the mean, and you divide that whole thing by the standard deviation. I'll abbreviate standard deviation. 
Oh, I meant to draw a left parenthesis here. There we go. So data item minus mean divided by standard deviation. So looking at A, 88, I can't use this table until I have my z-score that's associated with 88. So if you're looking at a number and you're like, the homework gave me the table, but I don't see 88 on the table, that's your cue. you got to first convert it to a z-score before you can ever, ever use this table. So 88 is my data item minus the mean they told us is 74 divided by the standard deviation they said is 10. I'm going to do it in two steps. So I'm going to subtract in the numerator first, get it down to one number there on the top. So 88 minus 74, of course, gives us 14. Divide by 10, we get 1.4. So there's step one. Now step two, the way these tables are always designed is they give you the percent of the graph to the left which means below. So if you see the word like below or left, like we do in part A here, that means you can just simply look up the percent associated with your z-score and that's your final answer. So below, meaning to the left of a z-score of 1.4, look up the 1.4 z-score row and the percent on the right associated with it is 91.92. If you see the word below or to the left, you just use the percent in the table since the table is designed to give you that direction anyway. And bam, there's your final answer. So 91.92% of the scores will be below 88. B, above 88. I'll do B in blue. Well, step one normally would be to convert to a z-score, but I've already converted 88 to a z-score. We already said the z-score for 88 in this data is 1.4. Above, so everything to the right, if we were to graph this, remember our table only gives us to the left. So whenever you see the word above, you're still going to use your table to look up the percent associated with your z-score, but the extra step is you're going to take that percent and subtract it from 100% always. So that's why these little tiny words make a world of difference, like above. So I still look up the percent associated with a z-score of 1.4. It's 91.92, but I'm subtracting that from 100%. So 100% minus that 91.92 gives me a final answer of 8.08%. So whenever you see words like above or to the right, subtract the push percent in the table from 100%. See? The percentile of the score is between 85 and 88. So step one is always to figure out your z-score affiliated with your data so that you can, in step two, use the table. We already know the z-score affiliated with 88 is 1.4. Did that in part A and in part B. So really, we just need the z-score for 85. Using our formula, the data item is 85 minus the mean was 74, according to the original question, divided by the standard deviation is 10. So I'm going to do 85 minus my 74 in the numerator for 11 to divide by the 10, which is going to give me 1.1. Step 2, we always look up the percentages associated with our z-scores, but the key word here is between. So when you see the word between, you're then going to subtract the bigger percent minus the smaller percent every time. So the z-score of 1.4 was related to the percent of 91.92 still. The z-score for 85 was 1.1, and that z-score of 1.1 relates to the percent of 
bigger minus smaller, so the bigger percent was 91.92, minus the smaller percent is 86.43. You should always get a positive percent answer. You might have a negative z-score sometimes, and that's okay, but the overall percent answer at the end should be positive if you've done it correctly. So 91.92 minus 86.43 gives me a final answer of 5.49%. So to summarize parts A, B, and C here, step one, find the z-score using the z-score formula. Step two, look up the percent in the table the homework will give to you and the test will give to you, just like we did here. And then technically step three, if you see the word below, leave your answer, your percent as is. If you see the word above, take your percent, subtract it from 100%. If you see the word between, take your bigger percent minus your smaller percent.